I'm, I'm going to start things, get us introduced to our topic tonight, and then we will we will be anxious to hear from Dr. Pope. First of all, I'm Kimberly Farley. I am the Director of Homeschool Partnerships here at Classic Learning Test, and we are pleased to be with you tonight. Thank you for joining us, and we are really excited to hear from from Dr. Pope tonight about Thomas Hobbes. Uh, this is one of our authors that I just don't know as much about, so I'm really excited to learn more along with all of you. Uh, I want to talk to you just a little bit about CLT and what, you know, why we do this journey through the author bank and even what is the author bank. So I wanted to do that with you before we get started and then we will we will jump right into our conversation. But, you know, CLT has a mission statement that I want to share with you because I think it so nicely summarizes who we are and what we are about. CLT exists to reconnect knowledge and virtue by providing meaningful assessments and connections to seekers of truth, goodness, and beauty. So as we unpack that statement a little bit, we think about reconnecting knowledge and virtue. You know, it's a pretty modern idea that this education should be so utilitarian that you know our secondary schools are focusing so often on um, meeting college and career readiness goals instead of educating the whole person, like like used to be an emphasis. Uh, we think about colleges that that speak heavily of the return on investment, and we know that college is an investment, but you know we can't just measure what is gained through four years of education by how much money you make when you graduate. And so while those are considerations and worthwhile ones, we want to have a little bigger focus. You know, we agree with um, Dr. Martin Luther King who said the function of education is to teach one to think intensively and to think critically. Intelligence plus character, that is the goal of true education. And that's what CLT is about in reconnecting knowledge and virtue. So we do that by providing meaningful assessments. Now you may be thinking that's a bit of an oxymoron. How is an assessment all that meaningful? Uh, especially in the standardized test realm that can be a little challenging, right? But we want to put our students in front of the very best and most impactful things that have been written and said about the world and that have so influenced society and culture today. And that is what our author bank is about. So I'm gonna show you our author bank here quickly. So on our website, cltexam.com, you will see our author bank here. And we have these amazing authors like Jonathan Edwards and Louisa May Alcott and Dante and Jane Austen. Herodotus, Plato, Aristotle, Poe, um, and of course Hobbes. And you will encounter authors like these on the CLT, meaning that while you are taking this assessment, you may encounter things that make you think more deeply about the world that you live in and you know what, what meaning can be derived from it. But we also want to dig a little deeper. We want to go into some analysis and critical thinking and logic. It's the things that we want for our students to develop in life that they can read and analyze, not just accept blindly what they, what they read, but that they can think and process that. And so CLT is very unique in the fact that we really emphasize the analysis and critical thinking components. Additionally, we provide detailed analytics after the exam so that it is not simply about getting into a college or getting the scholarship or um, whatever purpose that, that may exist for it also, but we think that assessment should drive our education to be more meaningful and more tailored to the student. So our detailed analytics help families and schools to do that in a meaningful way so that the education is best tailored to the student who, um, who has now taken that exam and received valuable feedback. Beyond that, we like for, um, but we like to provide connections to seekers of truth, goodness, and beauty. And that is one of the things that we're doing here tonight. We are here with Dr. Tom Pope from Lee University. And Lee University has this mission also that it is about meaningful character education as well as um, 
you know, getting, getting ready for the next steps in life, whether that be further education or a career. But uh, we are very happy to be with Dr. Pope tonight. And I want to share just a little bit about, about him. And then we're going to turn it over and talk about Thomas Hobbes, the reason you all came tonight. So Dr. Pope is a professor of political science at Lee University. He teaches both political philosophy and constitutional law since 2010. Uh, he really highlights the deep connection between political theory and political life. Much of his work explores the lasting influence of Hobbes on modern society. Um, Dr. Pope received his PhD from Baylor University, and he also taught in Baylor's honors program while there in Waco, Texas, which helped to cultivate an interest in interdisciplinary dialogue over questions central to the human experience. This love of dialectical conversation led him to Lee, an institution that emphasizes holistic pedagogy and Christ-centered philosophizing. In addition to teaching, Dr. Pope serves as the director of Lee's honors program, Cairo Scholars, promoting a community of intellectually curious students across the curriculum. Dr. Pope is also the director of Lee's Center for Responsible Citizenship, which offers programming to highlight the need for moral and civic virtue as the foundation for, for life. So we are very pleased to be here with Dr. Pope tonight. And I think you will hear that um, what he is about fits very closely with CLT's mission. So happy to provide this connection for you tonight. And uh, Dr. Pope, take it away. Great. Give me one second to try to get my tech going. Let's see. I think that will work. Let's cross our fingers. Did that work? You can see. Absolutely. I can All see right. your screen. That is what we're going for. Okay. Well, oh dear. I've broken it. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, you know, I usually don't get the opportunity to just chat about Thomas Hobbes on a Thursday evening. Um, so thanks for the invitation to share my very niche interest in this remarkable man. So at this point, you're probably asking why Thomas Hobbes? I've looked through the Journey Through the Author Series uh, websites and have noticed that, you know, people have been covered like Shakespeare or Plato, Flannery O'Connor. Uh, and, you know, really, I'm not sure if Hobbes is going to be able to compete on just brand name alone. Uh, so I'll, I'll start by just talking a little bit about why I personally find Hobbes to be pretty interesting. So a couple of caveats before I jump in. Um, first, like many speakers in this series, I just have no idea how to use the internet effectively and lecturing for half an hour into the ether is just not my normal pedagogy. So I actually made my very first PowerPoint for this talk and you get to experience my hand-drawn artwork that usually ends up on a whiteboard. So congratulations. Secondly, I think it's kind of important to take authors on their own terms. So I'm gonna be faithfully presenting Hobbes and hopefully charitably presenting Hobbes. Uh, and what that means is like, just because Hobbes says something doesn't mean that I personally, Tom Pope or Lee University would promote that same idea, okay? So if you know anything at all about Thomas Hobbes, you probably have heard something like, uh, he thinks that people are terrifyingly wicked. And without some sort of like all powerful government to keep us in order, we're just gonna murder one another. And because that government keeps us from violent death, which definitely is the worst, uh, we should pretty much do anything that it tells us to do because you know even slavery is better than death. Let's see. So this here is a picture of the frontispiece of Hobbes' Leviathan, which he wrote in 1651. By far, uh, Leviathan is, is his most famous work. And you'll probably notice that it, it pretty prominently features uh, a guy uh, looming ominously over the countryside. He bears a suspicious resemblance, actually, to Thomas Hobbes. Uh, and this is kind of the idea that people have of Hobbes, uh, a scary guy that wants to conquer everything. Now, this 
caricature of Hobbes portrays him as a kind of like godless friend of tyrants and oppressor of the common man. He's actually, he's called the monster of Malmesbury by his contemporaries. Uh, he has to flee from England several times in order to avoid persecution as like an atheist and a royalist. And I mean, interestingly, later the royalists chase him out for naysaying divine right of kings, so he just can't cut a break. And even today, Hobbes's contributions are basically overlooked for the, you know, apparently kinder and gentler philosophy of our man, John Locke. And so the question that I'm really left with is, you know, how is it that somebody with a reputation so bad can continue to have such a profound influence on the world that we live in? So I would argue that Hobbes is the most influential political philosopher of the modern world. And that whether we know it or not, the political and the social paradigms of our time are just fundamentally grounded in a Hobbesian mindset. Hobbes is uh, what we would call the father of modernity. And that is kind of the philosophical era within which we still largely exist. So one, Hobbes is super important, all right? But two, I, I just find him charming. Uh, I think that he's kind of a fascinating character. He is immensely funny. Um, you know, like Socrates, uh, Hobbes has this understated wit that is just absolutely captivating. As long as you catch that every time he's writing, he's writing with a little grin. And also, kind of like Socrates, Hobbes is absolutely full of himself. He knows very, very well that he is the smartest man in the room, but this kind of over-the-top personality, it's self-aware and, you know, at times it's self-deprecating. I mean, here's an example. So Hobbes writes not one, but two autobiographies, right? This should tell you something about how Hobbes thinks about himself. Um, one of those autobiographies is in prose. The other one, he just writes in verse just to be funny, right? Hobbes, he really loves poetry and he loves literature and he has this lifelong correspondence with the classical tradition, particularly the classical Greek tradition. Um, his, his first kind of major work that he produces is a translation of Thucydides' History of the Peloponnesian War. He then, he, he translates Aristotle's rhetoric, and at the end of his life, the very last thing that he writes is translations of Homer, Homer's Iliad and Homer's Odyssey, which very few people have read. I'm actually writing an article on that, and it's crazy. So, you know, it's, it's really interesting. Hobbes is fascinated with antiquity, but He's really nervous about the wholesale adoption of ancient moral ontology. So ancient ontology and ancient philosophy taught that truth could be kind of spelled with a capital T. Truth is it's transcendent. It's objective. It's, it's something that all human beings strive to know. And this is you know, what you're going to hear from the other much more reputable CLT sessions on people like Dante or Plato or you know, even C.S. Lewis. You've got this transcendent good, and it provides us with a standard of the good life, capital G. And, you know, as Aristotle tells us, for everything that we do, it's ultimately done with regard to this greatest good. You know, we might not, not know what this good is, but it's something that's knowable to us, the ancients would say. And we try to live our lives approximating this idealized standard that somehow it's higher than and it's somehow better than us. Now, for the ancients, if for some reason, God forbid, this, this good just didn't exist, it would be a real problem, okay? You'd be left with an abyss. You'd have nihilism. You'd have confusion. You'd have meaninglessness, chaos, right? I, I can't quite stress how bad it would be for human beings if there was no transcendent good. You would just wake up in the morning and you'd ask yourself, what should I do? Should I eat cereal or should I murder my family? And both of these would be equally reasonable choices to you. Right? That's not a good life to live. But the trouble with the ancient paradigm is since Plato, we've had about 2,000 years to make some headway on truth. But we are no closer than we've ever been. And it, it just seems like this blind appeal to capital T truth is maybe stifling our ability to live well in the here and now. You know, during Hobbes's life, you could easily find examples of the religious wars in Europe or the conflicts in England or the persecution of Galileo or just the dismal state of higher education. 
And so, you know, finally, I think that I'm drawn to Hobbes because he's sympathetic and I'm sympathetic to his projects. He's trying to make the best of ultimately a bad thing. And having become skeptical of the promises of the ancients, he just doesn't want to slide into nihilism. So Hobbes tries to constru construct a kind of objective framework that is imminent, right? It's, it's with us rather than transcendent or above us. Truth isn't something that's like a beyond us. It's not above us, it's, it's with us and it's based in us. And so instead of asking questions like, how ought things be? We can instead pay attention to how things are. And we start to create through our own actions, through our own artifacts, principles that we can universally agree upon. And those principles then serve as the foundation for human life and human action. These things aren't perfect, right? It's not Plato's idealized form, but it's good enough. And it just lets us live. Now, I mean, don't get me wrong here. Like, I am on Team Plato. I'm on Team Christianity here, right? I philosophically side with the ancients. But I just, I think it's important to know that it would be naive to dismiss Hobbes's real concerns or to ignore really the courage that it takes to stare into the abyss and refuse to give in. So, all of that said, who is Hobbes? And much more importantly than who is Hobbes, because I don't, I'm not a historian, like what's the core of his philosophy? I mean, I think it's this. I think Hobbes is trying to navigate this kind of Scylla and Charybdis of too little and too much authority. So too little authority, it's, it's mob rule, it's, it's lawlessness, and it's ultimately nihilism. For Hobbes, this position was represented by the kind of parliamentarians of his time, the, the down with the king, power to the people, okay? On the other side, though, you've got too much authority, and too much authority is arbitrary rule. It's untested and uncritical inheritance. It's hearsay. It's superstition. And this position for Hobbes was represented by the royalists who saw their king as a kind of unitary hand of God. Now, both of these sides, right? Both these sides are unpredictable, they're selfish, and they're not amenable to reason. And life within either of these paradigms is unpleasant at best. So we are most familiar with Hobbes' social contract theory, but what he begins with is something really much more fundamental. And this, in fact, this, this fundamental philosophy is what distinguishes him from other thinkers who have said similar things, but earlier in history, right? So Hobbes is not the first philosopher to come up with social contract theory. If you've ever read Plato's Republic, Plato talks about social contract theory in book two of the Republic, okay? I mean, Machiavelli predates Hobbes by almost 200 years in describing human nature as fundamentally just not good. I mean, even Descartes, Descartes beat Hobbes by 10 years in France on scientific empiricism. So it's not those things that make Hobbes interesting. The thing that makes Hobbes exceptional is that he's able to develop and ultimately to articulate a comprehensive ontology of each of these elements. And he gives each of these things an account within an entire vision of human life and of the universe. So Hobbes opens Leviathan, which is you know, it's a meaty book, with a description of being itself. He's like Heidegger. And he talks about, just, how do you know anything at all? Well, the answer is you come to know things through your senses. If you couldn't sense a thing, it may as well not exist for us. That's not to say that the thing doesn't exist. It just may as well not exist for us. So for example, right right now, hopefully, if I look around, there, there are not hundreds of invisible goats dancing around this room, but I have no way of experiencing them. So you know, I may as well live as though there are no goats in here. If I can't experience it, I cannot live in light of the thing, okay? So for Hobbes, the external world literally impresses itself upon us and then our senses report to us these impressions, right? Hobbes is really interested in uh, early optics, as is pretty much everyone during the Enlightenment period, uh, because they're interested in sense perception and how you know the world. So light bounces off of objects. It enters our eyes. It 
pushes physically on our optical nerves. This in turn causes a physical reaction in our brain and we register that as vision, right? You can tell based on my lovely drawing I've, I've made here. So the sense perception decays in our minds and we are ultimately left with a kind of after image of the thing, the flower, whatever, right? And Hobbes calls that kind of residual after image imagination, right? That's our thoughts. That's anything you've thought ever. All things that are, are things that can be sensed. And therefore all things that are possess body because if it didn't have body, you could not sense it. And what that means is there is no thing that we can know which is metaphysical, right? The physical world is all there is. This has massive implications. If you wanna talk about this in the q and A, I'm I'm happy to do it. But you know, what this means is you have no original thoughts, right? Everything that's in your head, everything you've ever thought is predetermined in some sense and has come from the outside world pushing itself upon you. But you say, no, I've had original thoughts. I dreamt of a unicorn the other day. And Hobbes would say, no, you have combined horse with rhinoceros and come up with unicorn, okay? Similarly, you say, no, 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 no. I've had original thoughts. I chose to wake up this morning and go to school. And Hobbes would say, no, all actions are ultimately reactions. The things that you do are responses to external stimuli. This is tricky. It leads to a kind of material determinism, right? We're driven about by external and really internal forces just beyond our control. This might bother you, but you know, don't worry too much about the fact that you don't have any free will and you're just a robot. I mean, you can't help but feel as though you have free will. And so Hobbes essentially speaks to his readers as willing beings. He's like, yes, you have no agency. Yes, you are a puppet, but we're going to act as though you have will. Here we go. Okay. We'll just sideline that philosophic bombshell. I mean, interestingly though, right, for those of you playing along at home, it's worth noting that Leviathan itself is a kind of external stimulus that's designed to create a very particular effect in the reader, right? And so even as he talks about his readers as willing agents, you have all the choice in the world. It's like, just read this book though, and we'll get the outcome we want. Anyway, so if the universe is just sense perception of a fundamentally unknowable, what Kant would call noumenal reality, then our evaluation of the universe is just an evaluation of perception, right? In the face of some external stimulus, you can either like draw closer or pull further away. If I sense chocolate, I say, more please, and I draw closer to it, right? That stimulus uh, leads me to physically move towards more of the stimulus. But if I sense acid, I say, no, no, less please, none of that, and I pull away. And so it's literally a physical movement towards or a physical movement away from, and Hobbes labels these passions, these fundamental passions, appetites and aversion. And he says, all of human judgment and all of human action is ultimately one of those two things, movement towards, movement away from, okay? And we call things good, beautiful, pleasant, right? We call those things, those names, that which we desire more of. So if I say chocolate, more chocolate, please, I'll eventually start saying chocolate is beautiful and good and pleasant. And then we say, but those things we don't want, ugly, bad, evil. And we start using this language to simply describe movement towards or movement away. Uh, in another way, you know, John Rawls would call this emotivism, but it's interesting to kind of see the roots of it here. You might be asking yourself though, like, isn't this the same relativism that Hobbes is trying to avoid, right? Isn't this a world where I like cake and you like kicking puppies and it's all just the same, right? That's the kind of thing that Hobbes doesn't like. Sort of, but not quite. So while there might not be some sort of summum bonum or finis ultimus, right? A greatest good like Aristotle and Plato would want us to believe. You know what we could all get behind? Death is the worst. So here's an example. You put two people in a room and you have them discuss something 
controversial. You say like, uh, what's the best Star Wars movie? And then you walk away, okay? Come back 10 minutes later, and one of those people is probably dead, is at least bleeding in the corner because they've gotten in a fight, okay? Um, they can't agree on what the best thing is, but you take those same two people and you give them a choice and you say, would you prefer to watch The Phantom Menace or die a slow, painful death? And I promise they will pick Phantom Menace every single time, right? And that is what creates our objectivity, okay? We live in a world where there is not a transcendent objective truth, but I can create objectivity through a greatest evil. We're not agreeing on a common good, but we are avoiding a common evil. Now, Christians, right, will come back and say, but wait, 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 we've got a tradition of martyrs, right? Men and women who choose death, right? Isn't this a contradiction? Hobbes would respond in three ways, okay? And again, this is Hobbes speaking, not Tom Pope, Orthodox Christian, okay? Number one, Martyrs by no means represent normal human beings, all right? There's something odd about them. Um, aren't people that choose death over cake the very problem that we're trying to fix? And then three, and this is most important for Hobbes, martyrs don't believe that they are actually dying, all right? They believe in life after death. And they perceive their choice as heaven instead of death. And so in that sense, they want to avoid death just like the rest of us, okay? Just like, you know, we can generally say that human beings have two eyes and two ears, and you'll find occasional exceptions to that rule. So Hobbes can say that the strongest human passion is fear or aversion to violent death. Now, if this is true, if Hobbes is right, then we are gonna live our lives attempting to secure ourselves from that eventuality. And the trouble is that this kind of security becomes a zero sum game. My power is your weakness. And so Hobbes writes, I put for the general inclination of all mankind, a perpetual and restless desire of power after power that ceases only and ironically in death. And that's kind of sad and it gets worse. Because there is no transcendent good or bad, men have a natural right or liberty to engage in basically whatever means that they deem necessary to secure themselves. This is a pretty novel vision of right. And interestingly, it's the source of our modern doctrine of natural rights, right? When we talk about rights today, it's coming from Thomas Hobbes here. Now, unlike somebody like John Locke, who would say that people have exclusive rights, that is, if I have a right to something, you can't have a right to the same thing. Hobbes would say that in nature, our rights are inclusive. I have just as much of a right to your arm as you do if I determine that I need it. Our rights are ultimately confined by reason. Um, our reason is the thing that guides us. But ultimately, our reason just exists to calculate our advantage. And so... The only real limit on our rights by nature is the law of reason. And that law in sum is don't be an idiot. The law of nature, this law of reason, it's not handed down or enforced by God, right? You don't go to hell if you disobey this law of nature. Instead, you're just an idiot and you suffer the consequences that an idiot would suffer. You decide one day it's gonna be a good idea to hit your head against a wall, you're gonna end up with a very natural punishment of a headache, right? And so for Hobbes, the breach of the law of nature, it's self-enforcing. But if I genuinely and truly reason that your harm is my benefit, then I should stab away. It's complicated. And this problem of rights in Hobbes, it's compounded by the fact that human beings for him are all inherently equal. So we generally think of equality as a good thing, right? More equality, please. But for Hobbes, equality just exacerbates the challenges of nature. I mean, if you think about it, you and I are in the woods and there's only one piece of cake between us. I don't know why there's cake in the woods, but bear with me. 
I will size you up and I'll think, well, you know, I'm, I'm five, nine, 145 pounds on a good day. You're some internet person. I never know who you are. And I'll think I could, I could take you. Right. If we're all basically equal, I think I could probably handle you and you think the same thing. And then we fight and blood is shed and we murder one another. And that's not a good outcome for cake. Okay, so you might say then, all right, but we're not all equal, right? Some of us are bigger, some of us are smarter, right? Um, you know, I'm, I'm not eight feet tall, I, I'm not 200 pounds. Certainly I'll get beat up in a fight. Doesn't matter, Hobbes would say. For Hobbes, our equality is not based on our physique or our mental capacity. We are equal not in these things, we're equal based on our equal susceptibility to death, okay? If you've ever seen The Princess Bride, uh, you might remember the scene with Fezzik, this guy right here. Fezzik is played by Andre the Giant, uh, and he's fighting against the dashing but slender Wesley. And we learn from this scene, doesn't matter how big you are, even the little guys can take down the big guys. And even the big guys, they gotta sleep sometime, okay? So it's not always going to work out. And this situation leads to what Hobbes would call a state of war. It's a situation where at any given moment, you are not sure if you're gonna die. That means that you spend all of your time fighting with other people, making sure that your stuff is not stolen, you kind of hide in a cave. And the scenario looks like you don't have any friends. You don't have television. You don't have books. All the things that you value, right? Art, religion, music, friends, beauty, truth, justice, the American way, whatever, right? Those things just don't exist in the state of nature because all you can think of is how can I get my next meal and prevent the other guy from taking my meal? Now, you've still got reason, but reason just teaches you that you better fight and hit first. And if you run into somebody else, you can't quite trust them. It's not that we're wicked, right? It's not that we are by nature evil. So we're scared. It's that we're weak, right? I don't want to hurt you. I just am scared and don't want to die myself. And if there's only one piece of cake, I'd like to eat it. And so I'm going to try to eat it. That's not untrue of human nature, right? We feel this way. And we know, we know that it would be better to just put down our weapons and all sing Kumbaya and get along, right? We know that if we could just stop fighting, we could have more than this. But the trouble is who's gonna be first to put down their gun? It's not gonna be me. Because I know that if I'm the first person to do it, you're gonna kill me. And if you're the first person to do it, I know that I should probably kill you while your back's turned because I never know if you're gonna to try to stab me. So you've got this real problem that reason teaches us we wanna get out of the state of nature, you don't know how to do it, here's how you do it. We can't trust one another. And so what we do is we go looking for the biggest, toughest, baddest guy out there, right? The, the Andre the Giant, and we throw our weapons at him. And we say, take this, please don't kill me. And you kind of back off. And he picks up your weapons and he looks at you and he says, these small people are kind of crazy. Why did they just give me their weapons? They're weak now. And you say, please don't kill me. I'll do whatever you want. And he says, I don't know about that, but you just made yourself weak for me and I could kill you anytime I want to. So it would be stupid for me to kill you. I'd be an idiot to kill you. And that free gift to the sovereign means that the sovereign doesn't owe you anything. It's not that the sovereign is morally obligated to you, but the sovereign would be an idiot to look the gift horse in the mouth. And so now what the social contract looks like is we relinquish our right to all things. And we give up a portion of that infinite right to the sovereign. We say, listen, I don't want Sally's arm. I don't need it. She can keep her own arm, right? I just want this small area of life that I can live and not have to worry 
And Sovereign, you can just handle all that other stuff. Order us, dole it out. And it turns that equality into inequality. And inequality is just another place where order can exist. You cannot order equal things. You can only order unequal things. And so once the sovereign is made unequal to us, the sovereign can then order the whole. And now you have law, and now you have rules, and now you have civil society, and now we can trust one another because if you do something bad, that scary guy is gonna take you out. And suddenly you have friendship and community. But wait, wait, you know, do you really wanna give up your power to some scary guy? Isn't that person gonna just use it against you? And what, what about our inalienable rights? Aren't there limits to sovereign power? Well, Hobbes would say, yeah. There are a few rights that you could never give up, even if you say you've given them up. Because if you think about it, what's the source of a right? It's reason, okay? So you can never have given up those things which would be unreasonable to give up. There are three things. Number one, you can never give up your, your life. If you tell somebody, I will give you my life for a hamburger, that's a stupid deal and you are never bound by that deal. Even if you say that you've given up that right to life, it is not binding because the only thing that binds you is your reason and that is unreasonable. The whole reason you went into the social contract is protect your life. Secondly, you cannot have given up your liberty or what Hobbes says, freedom from chains. If somebody says, um, I'm going to put you into absolute servitude to me and I'm gonna bind you up, that is equivalent to taking your life because as soon as you are bound in that way, you can never guarantee that they're not gonna kill you, okay? So that kind of absolute enslavement uh, is not something that you could ever reasonably have been said to have relinquished. And then third uh, whoa, whoa, is your pursuit of happiness. Hobbes says, he frames it this way, he doesn't say pursuit of happiness, that's a Thomas Jefferson thing, but um, he says, men can never have been thought to have given up their life in such a way that they would grow weary of it, okay? So, if what you really love more than anything in the world is collecting stamps, that's the thing that gives your life meaning and purpose, right? And without stamps, you would just rather not be on this earth. Well, the whole reason you want life in the first place is to collect stamps. The whole reason you want liberty is to collect stamps. And so if the sovereign were to ever say no stamps for you, you should rebel because that is the thing that gives you joy. And so for Hobbes, the pursuit of happiness undergirds human life and human liberty. And so those three rights, if the, if the sovereign ever tries to take them away from you, you should say state of nature is better. I'm going to take my chances out there. The sovereign's still going to try to kill you, but you get to morally run. It's not unreasonable for you to run away. So what does that mean? It means that there are some limitations on sovereign power. It means that the sovereign can't just do anything that he wants to. We often think of the Habesian sovereign as being a tyrant, somebody that can do whatever he wants to, but the sovereign always has to keep in mind that if he contravenes the whole purpose of civil society to begin with, the citizens are gonna leave. The citizens will not continue to support him. Furthermore, the sovereign being reasonable himself recognizes that the strength and flourishing of the people directly corresponds to the strength and flourishing of the sovereign. And so what Hobbes is trying to teach the citizens is stop complaining about your government. But what Hobbes is trying to teach the sovereign is you need to work towards the common good because the stronger your people are, the stronger you are and the more you get. The sovereign is bound by the law of nature, which is reason. And if the sovereign works to impoverish or harm his people, it's like bashing his head against the wall. He can do it. He has a right to do it, but it's just dumb and it will not help him. 
if you have questions about that, I have a lot that I can say about that. But what I'd like to point out is Hobbes is interested in not just bare base survival. Hobbes is not interested in you being enslaved to some sort of despotical, oppressive government. Hobbes is interested in beautiful things. He's a man that translates Homer for fun. He's a man that writes a verse autobiography because it's delightful. He's actually a pretty good friend. It's just that these things that we care about, the beautiful, the true, the just, these things require us to give up some more fundamental things to make sure that those necessities are taken care of so that we can focus on these. And that the ideal civil society accounts for these. So finally, what's the impact of Hobbes? Like why should we care about Hobbes today? I would say because Hobbes echoes through everything we do today. Um, my friend Joe Wysocki did a CLT uh, author series on Alexis Tocqueville. I'd encourage you to watch it because Tocqueville's awesome and Dr. Wysocki is awesome. But one of the things that Tocqueville harps on is Americans are kind of weird and they seem to have um, embodied enlightenment philosophy without even knowing it. And I think that's true. If you read uh, the Federalist Papers, right, Hamilton and Madison are the two major figures in the Federalist Papers. Sorry, John Jay. Uh, and one of the things we'll notice is Hamilton says in Federalist 51, right, he's talking about human nature. And he says, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. That's, that's literally what Thomas Hobbes says, right? And Madison spends, spends all this time in Federalist 10 talking about faction. We're selfish. We can't trust each other. And you cannot eliminate faction from human nature. That's a Habesian impulse, right? I think that Madison's vision of human nature is ultimately derived from Thomas Hobbes. Natural law is not going to be sufficient to stop us from being selfish, right? John Locke is not going to be able to stop us from being selfish. Similarly, Alexander Hamilton on the other end spends all of his time in the Federalist Papers and the convention talking about how we need to have a strong national government. We need to unify power because if you dilute power, People are going to go nuts. And ultimately, government is the thing that secures us and keeps us from destroying ourselves. It reminds us to keep focused on something beyond just our selfish, pa selfish passions. I think Hobbes is responsible for harping on the importance of that centralized power. For better or worse, I think Hobbes is the father of modern individualism. Hobbes views persons and humans primarily as individuals. We are by nature not political. We are by nature not a family. We're not Christians. We're not a church. We are ultimately individuals wandering around in the world for Hobbes. We might come together into communities, but those communities are artificial. They're not who we are at our core. Again, I personally, Tom Pope, do not believe in that, but I think most people do. And I think that Hobbes is the source of that common belief. I think for better or worse, Hobbes is the source of our modern doctrine of rights. We might not talk about them in the same way, but if you push at it, that's where they go. Hobbes talks about natural equality. I think Hobbes emphasizes what we would call technocratic government, which is government that uses science and reason to push its policies. I think that, uh, Hobbes is responsible for a government that's less interested in pursuing the good simply and instead just says, I don't know, do whatever he wants, right? Don't hurt each other, right? That vision of government ultimately finds its source in Habesian philosophy. Our reliance on science, scientific empiricism and the political um, promotion of science, that's Hobbes. Popular sovereignty, that the core of legitimate government comes from the people, that's Hobbes. And Hobbes provides a political pathway to enlightenment goods, written constitutions, air conditioning, modern medicine, property rights, golden doodles, all these aberrations, right? You don't get those unless somehow the enlightenment sticks. And the enlightenment doesn't stick unless it sticks in politics. As Aristotle tells us political science is the master science. It's the architectonic science. It's the art that governs other arts. And so Thomas Hobbes, by consolidating all these different ideas and creating a comprehensive political philosophy that talks about 
a broader ontology to undergird that, he gives an account of the whole that allows for all of these parts to move forward and take their place. So that's what I've got on Thomas Hobbes. I would be delighted to chat more about Hobbes in the Q&A. I appreciate your time. Yeah, please do post some questions in the chat. We would love to engage Dr. Pope a little more on, on Hobbes. I feel much better informed and understand him a little better. And certainly the impacts, I think that's always the part for me that's most interesting is like, where do we still see this? And, you know, where does this come in? Because we just, we don't talk about him as much as we talk about a lot of the others, especially as it relates to the founding, right? Yeah, I think it's really interesting. I uh, a lot of people trace the founding principles to John Locke, but in many ways, it's like it's Locke when it's a sunny day, but it's Hobbes when it's a rainy day. And the founders are very aware that there are a lot of rainy days out there. And so we might say Thomas Hobbes, bad guy, right? But come to find out, we incorporate his philosophy into most of our political institutions. Yeah, that's, it's absolutely fascinating just, you know, how far that goes. And he's writing in a time, right, where there's like, it's um, a sovereign, you know, royal, you know, kind of that form of government and how we're still seeing the impacts of that today in, in a democratic republic, right? Right. Uh, one of the major questions between political parties and just uh, of America is how much authority should be centralized, how much should be decentralized. And frankly, we, we vacillate between these two positions like a pendulum, right? It's either too much liberty, too much authority, nothing in between. And Hobbes sees himself as the moderate position, which is weird because we don't think of him that way. But he says, no, 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 I'm going to try to walk that tightrope. We do have a question in the Q&A from Michael. It says, isn't it unreasonable to place ourselves under the sovereign's power, wouldn't that be giving up our liberty? Yeah, absolutely. And Hobbes would say, yes, it is giving up some of your liberty, but it's not giving up all of your liberty. So in the state of nature, you have infinite liberty, right? Do whatever you want. And so the sovereign is only a finite individual. And so the sovereign can never take away an infinite amount of liberty. So however much he takes, you've still got an infinite amount left. And hopefully the liberty that the sovereign rationally takes is liberty you wouldn't want anyway. Like, do you really want the liberty to drive on the left side of the road? No, you'll just crash into other people. You've lost that liberty, but it's not a liberty you'd want. Now, sovereigns can take away liberty you do want, right? I hear most people don't want to pay taxes, right? But, you know, tell you what, like, if somebody said to me, I'm going to tax you 20% of your income, I'd say, no, nah, that's bad. And they say, okay, well, would you rather die? I'd say, no, that's worse. Please take my 20%, right? And I think for Hobbes, he needs to remind individual citizens that it's not like you would just have a happy-go-lucky utopia if you didn't have government. You would be dead, right? And that's the thing that we often forget about to our detriment. Yeah, I think definitely as you start talking about like social contract theory, right? It's that I'm willing to give up some of my tax money because uh, policemen are going to come to my house if I call them or firefighters if my house is on fire, right? Definitely there's the fear of death and they are trying to prevent that. And so I gladly give my money to, you know, to make sure that I have those protections, right? That's, that's kind of the basis of social contract theory, isn't it? Yeah. And also like it's it's that stuff, right? The the big scary stick stuff, but like you get roads. Roads are great. Hobbes in Leviathan says, you know what government should provide? A basic welfare system where people don't starve in the streets, right? So it's not just for Hobbes, the keep you from violent death stuff. That is a bare minimum, but he also says a, a prudent sovereign, right? A healthy civil society will work towards the flourishing of people. And that's where you start talking about, okay, well, now maybe we can talk about what we want, what we ought to do. Yeah, absolutely fascinating. Um, was there anything else you kind of mentioned this whole idea, which it got really, really deep for a moment about, you know, like this materialistic determinism kind of thing that, uh, is there something else there that, that you want to discuss? Yeah, I find, all right, so, I wanted to get to the social contract theory stuff, but if you look at Leviathan or really any of Hobbes' works, Leviathan is four books. One part one is on man, or and that's just like 
what is the universe and how do we perceive it, right? That's the ontology stuff. Then there's on civil society, right? Then he's got a third part called on the Christian Commonwealth, which is on a Christian Commonwealth. And that's like a good chunk of the book. And then the last part of the book is called on the kingdom of darkness, which is basically why the Catholic church is the worst. And so um, most of Leviathan is about things like the relationship between religion and the state. Uh, the frontispiece of Leviathan actually you know, we see the top part and you've got the guy holding the two things and he's holding a sword in one hand and he's got a bishop's scepter in the other hand because the state has to somehow navigate between both of these things. Um, and so his discussion of like, what is the world made of and what is the metaphysical world also refers to things like God, right? For him, God is body. Um, and God interacts with us through physical sensation, right? Even, you know, you see a burning bush. God has made himself incarnate in that bush such that we can sense him with our senses. God speaks to you in a dream. God has somehow touched, you know, the electrons in your head. I don't know if that's how that works. Uh, and, and you felt it, right? God could not do that if God were not body, Hobbes says. And so he's trying to create, here's the universe that is legitimate to deal with. And if you're operating outside that universe, that's not going to be a viable thing to discuss because that's where craziness is. You can kind of sense that's how modern science talks, right? For better or worse. Yeah, I think uh, it's really interesting how much of, I think most of philosophy, right, deals with a lot of the metaphysical and these other things and then arrives at the very practical of how do we govern. Um, Anyway, we do have another question. Let's see, this is a little bit longer, so I'll read this one. You said that Hobbes believed it was irrational for the sovereign to hurt his own people. Do you think this still applies in our current world where governments are elected? It seems that many elements of our political world incentivize our leaders to weaken the culture and the people instead of developing their strengths. Yeah, it's a good question. So Hobbes does say, and by the way, Plato says this too. So it's not just mean old Thomas Hobbes, but if you ever have a citizen that gets too strong, right? You got like a, a Mark Zuckerberg or something, right? You got to take that guy out because that person, that individual is going to have consolidated an independent amount of power such that you no longer have a clear sense of order or authority. And that's just bad, bad for everybody. And so individual citizens will be oppressed in civil society. If you, if your love is to rob banks, you're going to have a bad time in civil society, right? Um, and so individuals can be oppressed, but most of us are not going to be bank robbers and most of us are not going to be great men. And so it's going to work out. Um, I do think that the lessons we see today, uh, you know, Hobbes talks about a single sovereign, a unitary thing. He's, he's pro-monarchy, but he also says, listen, you don't have to have a monarchy. This could be a, a constitutional government, right? American government with, uh, you know, th separation of powers and federalism, that still works for Thomas Hobbes, okay? Um, the regime itself is the entity that is trying to consolidate overwhelming power. And we see that, right? Um, regimes can be stupid and democracies might be not all that bright sometimes. And so democracies might benefit from reading Thomas Hobbes and recognizing that if you impoverish your people and destroy them, that is not ideal for the flourishing of your political community. Well, that's a great transition to my next question, which is going to be, Dr. Pope, are these the kinds of conversations that you would have in the honors program at Lee? Can you tell us a little bit about what you do there for those who may be interested and just want to learn more about what Lee University offers and particularly the honors program? There? Yeah, absolutely. So I teach in political science at Lee. So this kind of thing is fun for me. You can kind of see the constitutional convention in my background, but um, first off, Lee University, it's it's a private, mid-sized Christian university in Cleveland, Tennessee. It's kind of right outside the Smoky Mountains, very lovely. 
Uh, it's affiliated with the Church of God, which is a Pentecostal denomination. You don't have to be Pentecostal to go here. I'm Orthodox Christian, and I'm here. Uh, what we mean by Pentecostal is just our students are deeply committed to the working of the Holy Spirit in their lives. And we we take prayer very seriously, and we take holiness in the Christian life very seriously. So that kind of active faith is something that Lee emphasizes deeply. Um you know, like 4,500 undergraduates, 53 majors, which might be a pretty big place if you're, you know, used to homeschool environments. What we find pretty interesting, though, is one, the broader university is fascinating and deeply interested in connecting Christian theory to practice, but the honors program called Kairos uh, is a kind of microcosm of that broader university culture. And it tries to take these intimate conversations that I'm sure you guys have uh, in, in your academic experience right now. And it tries to um, produce thoughtful interdisciplinary dialogue between friends. Um, Kairos is a hundred students at Lee, right? 25 incoming freshmen will join a cohort. They'll take uh, several of their uh, core curriculum classes together and they'll read books and they'll learn and they'll be able to carry those conversations through the entire curriculum. So even as you're in a major, let's say you're a political science major, right? You're in a major with people that aren't in the honors program and you can connect with that broader community, right? I think it's kind of important to get outside of a hermeneutically sealed bubble um, but you're still able to have that intentional conversation with a core group. And it's just fascinating to see those conversations build and carry forward over time. Um, Kairos is uh, something that has a curricular component and extracurricular components. We play board games together. People come over to my house when it's not COVID. Um, we have uh, lectures. We kind of handpick the professors. So I just think it's the kind of undergraduate education that I would have wanted to have. Uh, and that's how I try to model it. And the types of things you're learning and the types of things that the CLT espouses is something that we value. And we try to take that at Lee and connect it to a Christian life where it's not just learning about Plato and Aristotle, but very early on we say, how can you live this? And how can we equip you to go out into the world and be a person of character that's been shaped by their education. Thank you. That sounds fantastic. And I love the small class sizes. I think having that great dialogue and it really builds friendships too that are long-term because you discuss the deeper, more meaningful things in life. And that's, um, I think it's John Henry Newman talks about, you know, one of the most important things about a university are the people that you are surrounded by. So having those small cohorts within an honors college is, is so valuable and I think really helps breed that, that experience that is rich and life-giving. So thank you so much, Dr. Pope. I, I thoroughly enjoyed the lecture. Did not expect Star Wars references while talking about Hobbes. And so definitely kept me on my toes. And uh, your drawings are, are very fun. I think that's, you said your first stab at a PowerPoint. I'm seriously impressed. Usually these are on a whiteboard. Uh, I got to use color on a PowerPoint, so that's exciting. Yeah, that was, that was great. So I think that you nailed it and we are deeply grateful. Um, if students or family members that are watching this today, if they have some questions, is there a way for them to reach out and learn yeah. more about Lee or Kairos there? So Lee's website is leeuniversity.edu. You'll find it. Um, the Kairos website is kairos, K-A-I-R-O-S, honors.com. Uh, and then... My email address is thomaspope at leeuniversity.edu. I would be thrilled to chat with you. Um, so if you wanna schedule a visit out here, or just chat over Zoom. Please feel free to contact me. I'd be happy to talk about Lee, political science, Kairos, philosophy, whatever. I wanna come sit in on your classes. That was a lot of fun. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. It was a pleasure being here with all of you today. I hope that you guys will, um, Take this opportunity to go watch some of our other 
Journey Through the Author Banks that we've done, they are on our website at cltexam.com. Uh, and definitely go look for your next great read in our author bank. There may be some things there that surprise you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Pope, again. It was an absolute joy to be here tonight. Thank you. Have a good evening. Bye. Bye.